And let me start first with introducing our next speaker, uh, Mr. Andrew Miller. I mean, he joined Granta Design in 2001, initially concentrating on Granta's range of data products and developing it to analyze materials, test data. After the acquisition of Granta Design by ANSYS, he became the director of data products and collab collaborative R&D at ANSYS Granta. He is based in Cambridge, UK, which is very famous for its top, let's say, universities in the world. However, most likely, uh, of course, as well, he is currently working from his home, which is New, new, uh, new Market. Please welcome uh, Andrew and let us listen to his presentation about materials, data in electrical device design and simulation. Yeah, uh, thanks for that um, uh, introduction. Yeah, so. Um as you can kind of mention, I've been working um, in the area of materials data and data management for the last 20 years. Um, I've mainly worked within the structural domain, um, but a lot of the concepts that we've de uh, uh, developed over that time um, apply equally well to the um, electronics industry as well. So I'm going to be talking a bit about um, the importance of materials data and data management. Um, and how it applies to the design of electrical devices, um, especially when it concerns the 3D ICs. Um, I'll then introduce a concept called uh, Integrated Compu uh, Computational Materials Engineering, or ICME for short. Um, uh, and then at the end, um, we'll look at how these ideas that I've talked about previously um, are all being pulled together into a project uh, called Cornet. Uh, which um, ANSYS is uh, taking part in. Um, so firstly, uh, why, is in, uh, why is information about materials important to businesses? Um, well, here are a few, a few um, questions uh, from across the product lifecycle that require the right materials information in order to answer them um, correctly. For example, um, how do I reduce the environmental impact of my products? Or how do I reduce costs by using cheaper materials and processes without affecting the performance? Or how can I increase reliability? Obviously a key question for this group. Um, you can see that these questions are relevant in many different industries, not just aerospace or automotive, but all industries. And they affect key business drivers such as uh, growth, profit, and risk. Um, and this diagram here shows the kind of a design um, life cycle. And you can see that various types of materials information is needed um, across this in, um, entire life cycle. Um, for example, if you take the ideation stage right at the start, then um, it may be the aesthetic properties of some of the materials which are key. How do they feel? How do they look? What kind of quality do they bring across? Um, you then maybe get to the design and analysis phase where, where you need hard data for the materials as selection and product simulations. Um, all, this, uh, all these stages generate a lot of materials data which needs to be made available to a large number of user groups across um, businesses. So it's these issues that the um, Granta MI um, data management system was developed to tackle. Um, so, you know, that it can uh, manage all the types of materials information that an organization needs. And the idea is that it comes the gold source for corporate materials intelligence. Um, you might generate this data yourselves in your labs or in, or in the field. Um, or you might get it from your uh, uh, suppliers or from your partners. Now, we also ha um, have a large range of uh, um, data products ourselves, and you can um, supplement your own data with this data. Um, and we get this data from suppliers, we get it from research institutes, we get it from uh, various other industry institutions. Um, and we package it together into a consistent format so it's kind of easy to use and compare. Um, and we then uh, provide the tools to help you control and manage this data to, to um, ensure that it's always uh, traceable back to its source. Um, 
for example, you may have data which is still in um, development and you don't want to um, use in production, so you limit it to just your R&D um, teams, or you may have data that should only be used on a particular product group. Uh, so therefore, you can limit that data to particular groups within your um, organization. All this can be set up at, uh, and controlled centrally. So as was mentioned in the introduction, I kind of work for Granta um, Design, and uh, they've been developing the Grant MI system for the last uh, 15 years. Um, and uh, 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 kind of back in 2019, so last year, Granta Design was acquired by ANSYS, who are one of the leaders in engineering simulation software. Um, and Granta became the materials business unit of ANSYS. Um, and that really acknowledged the importance of um, accurate materials data in engineering simulation. Um, in the past, uh, as I mentioned before, that we really focus on the structural side of things. Um, but since uh, the acquisition, we've been tasked to um, spread our focus and um, focus on all the areas of simulation that um, ANSYS covers, and that includes um, electromagnetics and uh, sem uh, uh, semiconductors, all which are supported by um, the ANSYS platform. So what are the types of challenges uh, that um, engineers who are designing electrical devices face when it comes to the materials data are uh, used in simulation? So I'll just quickly go through three examples. Uh, the first is automotive radar. Um, so this is used extensively in autonomous and safety systems. Um, the antenna and systems used in these are kind of located very close to the structure and to the bodywork. Um, the materials in the structure and the bodywork causes the um, scattering of the beam. Um, now this either needs to be controlled or, or it needs to be understood to ensure the reliability of the system. Um, so therefore, when you're simulating these systems, you not only need the um, dielectric properties of the materials used within the system, you also need um, those properties of those materials uh, are used within the structures around them. Um, automotive radar operates at high frequencies, at 20, uh, uh, typically 24 and 76 gigahertz, and you find that at those kind of uh, frequencies, the dielectric properties can change uh, significantly. Um, another big use is 5G. Um, uh, so again, these run at very high frequencies, um, and you then start to see that the dielectric properties of the PCB laminates and the other packaging materials uh, become, in, uh, become increasingly important. Um, so for signal integrity analysis, um, these materials need to be characterized over a wide frequency range. Um, and at the f higher frequencies, um, you need to start to worry about causality effects, and therefore all your material properties need to be fitted to some causality models to make sure that the analysis runs um, um, correctly. Um, you also get more um, subtle factors such as the uh, roughness of the copper, um, the kind of thickness of the copper and its tolerance, um, and even the kind of a reinforcement style used within the PCB laminate. They can all start to um, um, have an effect when you're um, increasing the frequency and you are um, scaling down um, your circuits. Um, and then finally, um, onto um, the 3D IC packaging. So um, obviously that brings a lot of uh, performance and size benefits, as we've heard in um, 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 the kind of a keynote. Uh, but it also brings uh, challenges as well in terms of the materials. Um, so this kind of multi-layer, multi-material construction increases the risk of thermo mechanical failure due to the differences in the properties in each layer. Um, and uh, 
to really kind of do a good job of, of understanding um, how this is going to perform, you need to know the um, electrical, thermal, and mechanical properties um, of those materials across the um, expected operating temperatures. So uh, this is a 3D IC. I'm sure you all know this uh, far better than I do. But um, this is a typical stack. It's very complex. In fact, this really kind of uh, reminds me of a traditional composite kind of stack up layout we use in the aerospace industry. Um, so even though I'm not from this industry, a lot of things here are really um, similar to the to the kind of some of the problems that the composites industry has kind of um, had to deal with um, um, over the last 15, 20 years. So it's made from many materials. You have metals, which are high strength, got high stiffness, high conduct conductivity, um, toughness, and thermal expansion. Um, there are glasses and ceramics. Um, so they, again, have high strength and stiffness, but have a much lower conductivity, um, lower toughness, and uh, low thermal um, expansion as well. And then there are the polymers, which are mainly low strength and stiffness um, and have a low um, conductive, uh, conductivity as well, but a much higher thermal um, expansion. But with polymers, um, with the polymer chemistry, they can vary their properties by a huge amount, by the chemistry, by the fillers they put in. So you really know what, to, so you're really not quite sure what you're going to get with a polymer. So all these layers um, are there for a specific function. Um, they all need to work uh, together, but they're all potentially a single point of failure to this very complex system. Um, so what are the kind of the problems that we all get when it comes to these, this kind of complex stack? Well, um, as has been um, talking about uh, before, that the mismatch in the thermal expansion can lead to thermo mechanical problems. Um, now, this probably isn't going to lead to um, sudden failure. Um, but what it will do as you get this um, 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 thermal cycling, you also get um, uh, uh, stress of cycling as well. That can lead to fatigue, which can lead to premature cracking in the layers or um, delamination at the interfaces. Um, you also, um, if you have a mismatch in stiffnesses, coupled with the mismatch in uh, thermal expansions, um, along with the thicker structures. So this can lead to um, uh, warpage problems um, during the processing. Um, also, um, if you end up with large um, thermal expansions, then this can generate uh, large strains. And a, a lot of these uh, components, with the scale they're working at now, can um, change their performance characteristics. Uh, due to those um, uh, 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 high strains. Um, uh, so we also get the issue with um, uh, dielectric uh, layers, which have low thermal conductivity, um, and, and they kind of struggle to dissipate the heat which has been generated. Um, and by having these layers stacked on top of each other, then the, th uh, the thermal pathways to get that heat out is increasing, and that just exacerbates the uh, thermal control problem. And um, finally, uh, we have um, um, we have the properties, as I said before, they change extensively at high frequencies and can impact the device performance. So these problems are difficult to understand and control. Um, and so to really to understand it, you really need to be doing simulation. And to do those simulations effectively, you, uh, you need good materials data to put into those uh, simulations. So let's take a look at um, some of these in a bit more detail. So here, uh, so here we have a chart generated from one of our um, data products. Um, and this shows um, uh, some of the uh, materials which are mainly used in um, IC packages. Um, it shows the um, thermal expansion coefficient, and it also shows how it varies over um, temperature. So you can see that not only are there large um, differences in the CTE, um, 
you know, it covers, you know, three to four magnitudes. Um, you can also see that there are considerable changes with temperature. Um, also, as you can see by this purple line here, so this is a um, this is an um, epoxy molding resin. Um, those changes in thermal expansion can change considerably um, if it goes through some kind of a transition. So in this case, we are going through the um, epoxy's um, glass transition temperature. Um, we've also talked a bit about stiffness. So stiffness is measured or is uh, shown by the Young's modulus of the material. Um, again, um, this is a chart showing the same materials as before, uh, but here we're showing the um, elastic modulus um, against temperature. Um, and you see a similar trend here that there's, you know, a large variation um, in the modulus. Um, and um, uh, again, that, uh, like it changes um, a lot with temperature. Now, um, so if you have the thermal expansion um, rising with temperature uh, and the stiffness falling, then sometimes those two opposing changes can mitigate the effects of thermomechanical stresses. Uh, but that's not always the case, as can be seen here. So um, this chart shows the CTE and the modulus of a um, low TG epoxy um, um, resin uh, and how they change with temperature. And you can see here that the CTE starts to rise quite a bit before the um, glass transition temperature. Um, and it starts to go up a lot, um, a lot sooner than the modulus starts to go down here. So the result of that is that you end up with a spike in the thermomechanical stresses at around the TG mark. Um, and you can see that as compares to um, if you're just using a kind of a constant um, thermal expansion uh, coefficient. So here you can see that this is, you know, and you're, you've got about a 15, 20 megapascal difference here, um, which in the, you know, the components that you're dealing with can be quite large. So let's have a look at that and see what effect that really has on a component. Uh, so what we have here is a model uh, uh, of a BGA, uh, which has been um, done in um, Ansys Sherlock. Um, Ansys Sherlock is a reliability physics-based um, EDA tool uh, that provides a fast and accurate uh, predictions um, for electronics hardware at the component board or the um, system level. Um, so here on the left, we have our PGA, uh, sorry, our, our BGA uh, component. Um, and within the model, we've um, put in a low, low glass transition um, underfill um, with the properties similar to what you saw in the previous chart. And we're going to simulate it with an exposure from uh, temperatures from minus 40 to 85 uh, degrees C which, as you saw before, uh, takes the um, underfill through its uh, glass transition. And um, here we have then the, uh, 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 the, the result. And you can see now that um, with the underfill, you actually get a uh, higher stress um, in, those, um, uh, in those solder balls. And that's due to this uh, spike in the uh, um, thermomechanical stresses. So the fact is that a underfill is really there to try to re reduce the stresses. Um, but if you get it wrong, then it can actually make it worse. So let's also look at uh, PCB um, laminates as well. So um, there are over a thousand different grades of PCB laminate that you can, um, that you, that you can um, buy uh, on the market today. and um, uh, we've got a chart here showing um, a few of these um, plotted, and uh, uh, you can see that their properties change a lot. Uh, here we've got the dissipation factor versus the Young's modulus, and there's about a factor of 20 between the high and the low for both those properties. And there's a lot of different things which can affect um, uh, the actual um, performance. Um, so you've got the resin type and resin content, the reinforcement type and st style, uh, uh, 
the thicknesses of both the laminate and uh, and the copper and the surface roughness. Um, so it's very tempting to say, well, I don't have the properties for this particular grade that I'm using, but I've got something similar. Well, this shows that something similar can often not be uh, um, cannot give you the right data that uh, that you really need. Um, it's not just the material itself that can have a difference, as we've mentioned before, that you have to know the properties of that material at the conditions you're going to be running it at, and that means mainly the kind of temperature and the frequency. Um, and uh, again, you see here that um, you know that when you start to increase the frequency um, considerably, then things like the uh, um, the um, uh, loss tangent starts to kind of go up uh, considerably. If we're using data from around here, then you're not really accurately modeling the properties of that material. Um, another factor is multi-physics. Um, and uh, uh, so previously, you know, that um, uh, simulation has evolved with different physics. You've had structural, electromagnetic, and fluids, um, optical. Uh, today's engineering problems, you really need to put all those together in a multi-physics approach. Um, one thing about that is that the materials you're using should be common um, across all those simulations, and you should be defining them consistently. Um, so we take this as an example. Again, we've got a packaged IC. As we've already talked about, it's made from many different types of material. Um, so you might first do a, um, and you might do a current density simulation in, in something like um, ANSYS SI wave. And for that, you'll need things like the um, electrical properties, DK, DF, the, con the conductivity. Uh, we then may take the thermal losses from that, so, sorry, the current losses and put it into a thermal analysis using something like ice pack. Um, and here we need the thermal properties, thermal conductivity, specific heat, and the density as well. And then we may take all that and put it into a structural simulation um, to get the stresses and the deformation. And here we need things like the um, elastic properties, such as the modulus and the Poisson's ratio. Um, uh, and ANSYS in a pretty unique uh, position where we have these simulation, um, all these uh, simulation tools which Deal with all these physics, and we're also coupling it with a a materials data library um, and also a data management system, which is fairly about, unique. About five more minutes, Andrew. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, so I want to talk about um, a bit about, about um, a bit about multi-scale modeling. Um, so this is kind of something new here. So um, uh, at least to the materials um, side of things. So um, those properties are really defined at a very small scale. Um, and there are lots of different codes out there which can predict the properties at these small scales, and you can build them up. Um, but when you start to link these together, then you can start to do um, great things. Like you can then start to understand the, um, the, um, how the product performance is influenced by the composition and the processing at very small scales. And you can also look and say, well, how does the, um, how can we make the materials that are needed for the next generation of products? Um, and for um, uh, 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 Granta, so we've been using the Granta MI system um, to facilitate this. So we basically have the data management, so we are managing all the data that needs to run those simulations. We're taking the output from the first one, storing it, and then putting it into the next um, series of simulations. And we're working them while we're way um, up and down those scales. Um, for this type of simulation, you need to be um, validating it against real data. So we can also store the physical test data. Um, and uh, we have the tools to allow you to compare and to calibrate uh, your simulations to the real data. Um, but it's not just about the data. You also need tools to help you design those testings and those uh, simulations and the workflows to um, kick it all off and let it run in the background. Um, so the case study, and I will have to go through this uh, rather quickly. Um, so 
where we're applying this is in a um, Horizon 2020 um, funded, so this is an EU funded project, um, where we're looking at organic electronics. Um, and uh, so the problem with organic electronics is that um, they are using amorphous materials such as polymers and, and inks. And not a lot of know, uh, um, is really known about that, about how you, uh, about, about how, um, um, about, the ha uh, uh, about how the charge transport works. Um, and so there are lots of different um, uh, scales that you can look at this. So this is where the ICME solution comes in. So we are looking at different protocols at different levels. Um, and then we are storing all this in a grant MI system. And basically, I'll skip through this. We'll look at different levels here. So we're looking at uh, um, the electronic level to understand the transport parameters. Um, we're understanding the, the uh, molecular assembly. And we're putting all that together to understand, well, where are those um, electrons going to hop to? What's the probability of those um, electrons moving? And this is all done at di uh, different scales. Um, and then we're rolling that up into the, de uh, uh, into, the de uh, into the device. So he can see that we are testing the materials. Batch variability is an important thing here. We're testing the layers. We're simulating the layers. We're testing those devices, which are uh, um, all, all, um, all those la uh, layers bonded together. And then we're looking at the systems um, over where they're being used. Um, and this is just showing you kind of a bit more detail um, about the database structure by which we use to store all that data. Um, so the result of this is that we're going to end up with a data management system, which is um, suitable for uh, organic um, electronics. We're going to have a database full of data, um, and we're going to know a lot more about the best way to uh, model these um, organic um, electronics. Uh, so finally, just to uh, thank um, our partners, uh, especially at the University of Ionia um, in Greece, and also my um, colleagues um, at Ansys Granta. Myself, I have uh, two questions. I mean, the very first one uh, is about how do you solve the issue with versioning, um, versioning of the, uh, let's say, material models. I mean, at least now our experience is that quite few people working on the same, let's say, material, and we do material characterization at, uh, let's say, different stages of the project. And then, of course, this leads you now to different material models. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to somehow to track this in this uh, grant term? Yes, so there's two key things here. One is the traceability. So you need to know where those models are coming from so you can trace it back to the original data. Um, and the other thing is collaboration. Now, you'd like you say that if you get uh, different groups trying to characterize the material for different uses, then they might end up with different um, different um, uh, models. But that's fine, you know, because if they are coming from the same data and they're using it for different things, then they might end up with two different models, and they can be complementary. Obviously, the biggest problem is if you get two groups um, who are working and they end up with completely different models, and they're meant to be the same. Um, now, obviously, any computer, um, any database system can't solve that, but it can certainly help you to identify why you've got different models um, and uh, can basically help you um, to unpick why you've got different things and then decide, is there one model we should be using? So it won't solve the problem, but it helps you to shine a light on it and um, identify where the problem comes from. Another question that I have, uh, do you have any kind of optimization, let's say, engine in this uh, software so that allows me, for instance, to create a material model or material parameters for a specific model based on the measurements? As an example, in case of, um, let's say, linear viscoelastic material models, you always mm -hmm. have to, let's say, identify the prony terms as well as shift factors. Um, for some creep, let's say, constants, for creep, let's say, related models, you need to identify creep constants, I mean. Yeah, I mean, that's a really um, um, interesting point because um, uh, there are two ways you can do that. You can run lots of different simulations, and uh, we have a, te 
a technology called OptiSlang, which basically allows you to automate the whole fitting process by basically running lots of different fits in the background and then optimizing the fit. Um, the other way we're looking at now, and, and uh, this has just been released, I think it was the last version of our software, is looking at AI um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to do this. And basically, it's um, one of the things about fitting data to a model is that you have to get your initial estimates right. So your initial uh, coefficients are correct. Now, that's a real kind of hard thing to do, and that can often lead to bad fits. So here we're using AI to basically guide the user to get the correct estimates for their first coefficients. And that then allows um, the fitting routine to have a lot more success. Thank you very much for your excellent speech. Okay, well, thank you for um, inviting me to speak.